Bully for You, Teddy Roosevelt, Chapter 5. Although Colonel Wood was recognized as being first in command, the public acted as if this were Teddy's regiment. At first, newspapers re referred to the regiment as Teddy's Terrors. Roosevelt hated the nickname Teddy, even though everyone except his family and close friends called him that. Soon, the papers found the right name, the one that stuck. Roosevelt's Rough Riders, that's who they were. 1,000 men selected out of 20,000 applicants. The best riders, the best marksmen, the hardiest, they were a mixed lot. Mostly cowboys from the Southwest, a few Native Americans, but also athletes from Eastern colleges, a star football player from Harvard, a champion tennis player, high jumpers from Yale. They wore blue kerchiefs around their necks, had a bald eagle for a mascot, saying, There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight, an adored lieutenant, Colonel Roosevelt. They were men of a kind whose closeness turned out to be not just wartime, but bo a wartime bond, but a lifelong one. Teddy was proud of them and was pleased with the way the war was going, according to the plan he presented to the president. On May 1st, Commodore Dewey had taken his fleet to the Philippines and in short order had destroyed almost every Spanish ship there, all without losing a single American life. Now for Cuba. Of course, it was important to have a quick victory in Cuba. But, but for Teddy, it was absolutely essential that his regiment play a part in that victory. The question was, would their orders come in time? Would they be among the first to go? He wrote to the president from Texas, We are ready now to leave at any moment, and we earnestly hope that we will be put into Cuba with the very first troops. The sooner the better. At the end of May, a, te a telegram arrived ordering that the regiment to Tampa, Florida for immediate embarkation on transport ships. It looked good, but immediate? Was anything in the Army really immediate? They didn't even leave immediately. After loading the horses on seven trains, the men found there were no trains for carrying them. They had to sleep beside the railroad tracks and wait until the next day to start. It took four miserable hot days to reach Tampa, and then, for some unexplained reason, the train stopped seven miles short. So the Rough Riders mounted their horses and rode the rest of the way to the enormous tent city where the Army was camped. More waiting. Three days later, on June 6, news came that despite their drilling on horseback, the Rough Riders were not going to operate as a cavalry regiment after all. Only, all. only the officers could take horses with them. Worse still, not, only, not all the men could go. Only 560 out of the 1,000. Nothing that Teddy Roosevelt did in Cuba was harder than giving this news to those who couldn't go. The next day, the men were to leave, but the train that was to take them to the point of embarkation didn't appear. They were told to go to another track, but still no train came. And Teddy was not going to be left behind because of some foolish train mix-up. When he saw some coal cars, he told his men to climb aboard. So what if the engine what if the engine was heading the wrong way? They simply told the engineer to go backward, and he did. Finally, they were at the water and could see the ships. They were told which ship they had been assigned to, but two other regiments already had been assigned to the same ship. Still, the Rough Riders were there, and Teddy told them to get aboard on the double. Once they were on, he figured no one would be able to get them off. Teddy simply told the other troops that he was under orders to hold the gangplank, and that's what his men did. But did they sail? No. Some unidentified warships had been spotted at sea. The Rough Riders would have to wait until it was considered safe to go. Six days. Six days, they waited. Crowded in that hot, stuffy quarters while horses died, food spoiled, and water turned bad. At last, on June 14th, the regiment sailed. 31 transport ships stretched out over 25 miles of water. They still weren't sure where they were going. No one had said they were going directly to Cuba. The, off the official word was destination unknown. Perhaps there was an intermediate spot where they could do they would do some more waiting. Perhaps Puerto Rico. But no. When the fleet turned southwest directly toward Cuba, a cheer went up from deck to deck of every ship. Teddy Roosevelt, waving his hat in the air, broke into his Indian war dance. Although the Rough Riders were expected to land after the men in the regular army had landed, Teddy, still afraid that he'd be left out of the fighting, managed to have his ship get to shore first. While the men splashed through the breakers to the beach, the horses were lowered into the water so they could swim. Teddy had two horses, but only one, Texas, made it. The other, rain in the face, drowned. For several days, the men were separated from their supplies. Still, Roosevelt had his feet on Cuban soil, even though all he had with him were his gun. All he had with him were his gun, ammunition belt, sword, 
yellow raincoat, and a toothbrush, and of course, 12 pairs of glasses. Navy ships, which had preceded the transport ships, had bombarded the coastline and made it safe for the American troops to land. They had also blockaded the harbor at Santiago, a large seaport where Spanish ships were anchored. But in order to win this war, the city of Santiago had to be taken by land. And between Santiago and the American troops lay hills heavily defended by the enemy. Time was on the side of the Spaniards. If the fighting went on too long, the Americans wouldn't have to be killed. They would die of malaria, yellow fever, and dysentery, jungle diseases that were new to them. Along the shore, they faced a difficult seven-mile stretch that had to be covered before the army could turn in the, inland. Refusing to ride while his men were on foot, Teddy marched with them in a down, downpour of rain. Then the Rough Riders, along with two regiments from the regular army, were ordered into the hills to attack the Spaniards in their advanced positions. But who had ever seen country like this? A jungle of trees with branches twisting overhead, and underfoot the ground gone wild with growth. Insects swarmed, letting everyone know that they owned the place. Teddy Roosevelt's first impression of war was, it was confusing. I had an awful time trying to get into the fight, he wrote later, and trying to do what was right when in it. And all the while, I was thinking that I, I was the only man who did not know what I was about. Whereas, as I found out later, pretty much everybody was as much in the dark as I was. To make matters worse, Teddy's sword kept getting between his legs as he walked. He never wore it again. When the bullets came, they sounded, Teddy said, like the ripping of a silk dress, followed sometimes by a pop, which meant that someone had been hit. But where was the shooting coming from? In spite of all his glasses, Teddy couldn't see. Even when they came to a valley where the ground was more open, he still couldn't see. Since the Spaniards were... Yeah, he still couldn't see. Since the Spaniards were using smokeless gunpowder, finally he did spot a trench with some cone-shaped hats sticking up from it. Once they had a, had a visible target, the Rough Riders sent those cone-shaped hats running. Later, they attacked a set of red-tiled ranch buildings from which the Spaniards were shooting, and again, the Rough Riders were successful. They got rid of the Spanish soldiers and took possession of the buildings. <clears throat> In this first experience with war, Teddy also had a chance to see its horrors. All the Rough Riders who survived would remember how their comrades were alive one minute, dead the next, and how almost immediately their bodies were attacked by giant land crabs clicking their claws and by vultures diving down for the kill. Teddy had expected horrors, and he admitted that war never changes its hideous phantasms. Still, over the years he had learned how to shut his mind to grief, so even when some of his best friends were shot, he would grit his teeth knowing that his job was to take care of the living and go on with the war. But at the end of his first day of skirmish, Teddy was still confused. What had really happened? Had they done well? Had he handled his troops correctly? When he met up with the three commanding generals and Colonel Wood, he wondered what they would say. As it turned out, he had done well, and he was relieved to hear it. As I was quite prepared to find I had committed some awful sin, he said, I did my best to accept this in a nonchalant manner. It was a week before Americans made their big assault on San Juan Hill, their main target. In camp, they washed their bloody uniforms, took care of their wounded, and scrounged for food, since supplies had been, too, had been slow in coming. Teddy had already picked up three empty Spanish cartridges to take home as souvenirs for his children, and perhaps it was at this time that he wrote a letter to seven-year-old Ethel. Here there are lots of funny lizards that run about in the dusty roads very fast and then stand with their heads up. Beautiful red cardinal birds and tanagers flit about in the woods, and the flowers are lovely, but you never saw such dust. I have a mosquito net because there are so many mosquitoes. The big battle for San Juan Hill took place on July 1st, 1898, a day that Teddy would call the great day of my life. No longer confused, he could feel his own power even before the fighting started. Two commanding generals had fallen ill with fever, so Colonel Wood was put in charge of one brigade, and, Teddy, as, and as Teddy wrote, to my intense delight, I got my regiment. In battle first in command of the Rough Riders, Colonel Roosevelt became a different man. Cool, calm, and very heroic, as one of his men reported. He acted deliberately, looked out for his men, and concentrated on his obje objective with an intensity that inspired confidence. This was real war today. Massive, cruel, bloody, shattering. When the Rough Riders, became, when the Rough Riders came to a creek, they found they had to wade through water already clogged with dead bodies and running with blood. Some didn't make it across the creek, but those who did fell into the tall grass. 
on the other side and crawled forward on hands and knees so they would that so they would be hidden from the enemy not Teddy mounted on Texas an easy target but somehow surviving he rode up the lines of his men keeping them straightened out and headed in the right direction something primitive and animal like in Teddy took over there was no past no future for him there was only now pitched at a height never experienced before Teddy said he felt the wolf rising in him and it was a wolf that would not be stopped when he came to a contingent of army regulars blocking his way, he asked why they didn't charge up and take the hill in front of them, which the Spaniards controlled. They couldn't do it, the officer in charge replied. They hadn't received orders. Teddy said he would give the orders, but still they didn't think this was enough. Perhaps they didn't want to think so. The Spaniards were on high ground with open country around them, a perfect military position for mowing down approaching troops. So Teddy, to, Teddy, to Teddy, it didn't matter how well positioned the Spaniards were. He was here to defeat them, and he intended to do it. Then let my men through, sir, Teddy said, and I marched through, Teddy reported, following, followed by my grinning men. I waved my hat and went up the hill in a rush. The Rough Riders took the hill, Kettle Hill they called it, because they had found a kettle at the top. It was not San Juan Hill, but it was a hill that, no matter how difficult, had to be captured first. San Juan Hill next, with Kettle Hill firmly In okay. in American hands, the Rough Riders attacked San Juan Hill. They were the first to arrive and took part in capturing this important stronghold. When finally they could take a break, they cooked the food and the fleeing uh, the fleeing Spaniards had left behind. Salted flying fish is what Teddy remembered, and they ate it. He said with relish. Then the tired men of the regiment lay down on the hill for the night, knowing that although there would be more fighting, the worst was over. Eighty-nine of their men had been killed, the highest percentage of loss that any regiment had suffered, but Teddy believed that this only proved that his regiment had been the bravest. In any case, he did not lie down with his men. He, was, he wasn't ready to rest. The wolf in him had not settled down. Here he was, the highest officer in command of the highest hill before Santiago, and he knew now what battle was. He would never have to wonder again. <clears throat> He must have also suspected that with Americans on the edge of victory, he might be considered a hero. One of his good friends, a reporter, was traveling with the Rough Riders, and when this reporter wrote stories, they made the headlines. Hour after hour, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt paced up and down San Juan Hill, glorying in his great day and in what he called his crowded hour at Kettle Hill. Later, when he talked about that day, and he talked about it a great deal, he would wind up by saying it was a bully fight. How he loved the word bully. Two weeks and two days later, on July 17th, the Spaniards officially surrendered, but it was a strange surrender. The Spanish general asked a favor of the Americans while the Spanish soldiers were handing over their weapons. Would the Americans please bombard Santiago, aiming not at the buildings, but over them? That way it would be less embarrassing for the general. He could say he had surrendered under fire. The Americans obliged him. With the war over, the Rough Riders and indeed all the American troops were just as anxious to leave Cuba as they had been to get there. Every day more men were being struck down by malaria, but the War Department seemed in no hurry to bring them home. So in a formal letter written on August 3rd, Teddy Roosevelt pointed out that his army must move at once or perish. It was against all army practice for an officer to address his superiors in Washington in this way, yet Teddy had the backing of many of the highest-ranking officers in Cuba. The War Department was not pleased with the letter, but it did act, and Teddy made the headlines again. Ever since his great day at San Juan Hill, he had become America's hero, and there was talk of making him the new governor of New York. On August 15th, a cheering crowd met the ship with the returning Rough Riders at Montauk Point on Long Island. Long before the ship could even dock, the crowd was calling for Teddy. He stood at his railing, a small figure waving his hat, but even from this distance, his voice boomed out. Oh, but we had a bully fight, he shouted. He was just like a boy, a newspaper reported, who had thrown le his, le his lessons to the wind. The crowd went wild. When Teddy arrived at Oyster Bay that evening, the people in the village rang every bell that could be rung and fired off anything that would make a noise. Teddy grinned his big grin and waved his hat furiously. There was no question about it. It was fun to be a hero, but he wasn't ready to talk about being governor. He hadn't finished being a colonel. After a short visit with his family, he went back to Montauk Point to be with his boys before they were mustered out of the army. On September 13th, he finally had to say goodbye. It wasn't easy. 
As a surprise, the Rough Riders presented Teddy with a bronze statue of a Bronco Buster, waving his hat in typical Teddy fashion. Then they lined up before him to shake his hand. He said a personal goodbye, calling each one by name. Before it was over, many were in tears, and one private confessed that a handshake wasn't enough for a man like Teddy. He wished he could have hugged him. Still, it wasn't a final, as final a goodbye as they all might have imagined. Those Rough Riders walked in and out of Teddy's life to the end of his days. One of the riders was already looking to the future. Three cheers for the next governor of New York, he shouted. Four days later, on September 17th, Theodore Roosevelt publicly announced that if nominated, he would agree to run for governor. Not everyone wanted him to go further in public life, however. Some were afraid of his big ideas and his super patriotism. Did he want to turn the United States into an empire, they asked? But it was hard to put down a man as successful as Teddy. And as he went on being successful, and he went on being successful. On the evening of September 25th, he was informed that he had indeed been nominated as the Republican candidate. Of course, he made his usual vigorous campaign tour. A whistle-stop trip through New York on a special train. He was accompanied by six Rough Riders in full uniform, one of them a bugler who blew the cal cavalry charge at every stop. On November 8th, he was elected governor of New York. He was in bed at Sagamore Hill when the news arrived. He put on his red dressing gown and went downstairs. And when he heard the news that he'd won by almost 18,000 votes, he grinned. That's bully, he said. But later, when he had time to reflect, he wondered about his future. He had just turned 40, and momentarily, he was a bit frightened. I have played it in bull luck this summer, he said. First to get into the war, then to get out of it, and then to get elected. Could such luck last, he asked a friend. He was at the crest. Would he begin to go downhill? I may fail, you know, he admitted. Then suddenly he turned bashful. It won't make any difference to you, will it? He asked. It was almost as if he were speaking to his father.